Welcome to Casual Friday. So this week I want to tell you about a book I checked out from the Textile Center Library a couple of months ago, but never really took a very close look at it until just this week. I also want to show you a finished object that I completed a few days ago, as well as a new project that I just started yesterday that has become a tradition in my family. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that tradition and, and how it came to be. And then I want to answer a question, both specifically but in general, about when to use a particular cast on for a project. So let's get started. Okay, so a couple of months ago, I think it was at a guild meeting where the librarian stood up and passed around all the, the new um, books that she had acquired. And there was one that seemed uh, interesting to me. And so I went and checked it out. And I briefly looked through it and I thought, this is fascinating and I wanted to tell you guys about it. But I, I needed more time to actually look through it and see what was really in it. And then I started doing my uh, tour of my knitting library, which took weeks and weeks. And so this book has been sitting on the floor next to me here for two months. It's overdue. I need to return it. So I wanted to take a closer look at it and I was completely fascinated. Uh, I'm going to return the book this weekend, but then I'm going to order it so I can get a copy for myself because it hits every sort of button that I have when it comes to books on traditional knitting styles. So the book is called Traditional Danish Sweaters and it is by Vivian and I probably am not going to pronounce her last name correctly, Hawksbro. Uh, I, I will see if I can spell it on the screen here. The O in Hawks, the first O in Hawksbro has a a line that goes through it. So I'm not really sure how that's pronounced. This is just the most interesting uh, book I've seen in a long time um, because I, uh, just about a year ago I got really interested in vintage and antique sweater patterns because the term sweater referred to a garment that you wore while sweating, typically in order to lose weight maybe, or more commonly, if you were going to be doing an athletic activity. So it was something that was stretchy, but it was something that you would wear while you were sweating, which is why in the US they called them sweaters. And it was a, it was a kind of a new garment in terms of being used for that purposes. There certainly have been knitted shirts of all types throughout the centuries. The Gansey, the Fisherman's Gansey, is certainly an example of that. That was a very specific work shirt that had a very specific reason and had a very specific uh, construction method. So one of the things that I have been fascinated with is how techniques have been used and how fashions changed and all of that. And it's really been kind of like a 130 year time period uh, to look at. So what is so interesting about this is that there is a traditional garment, a traditional a Danish garment that is in English called a night sweater, but the, the word for it, which I will put on the screen here, I have no hope of pronouncing without the help of a Danish person. Uh, the word literally translates to night shirt. But at the time these garments were first being used or being worn, there was very little distinction between what you wore in the daytime and what you wore at nighttime. At nighttime when it was cold, you took off as few clothes as you needed to. And so it wasn't until later in the 19th century that there began, began to be this distinction between what you wore to bed at night and what you wore during the daytime. So what she did was she went to these museums and I love this. I love that there are so many books these days where people have gone to museums and examined the pieces and really looked at how they were constructed, uh, ex examined them inside and outside, made observations about what was true in general and what may have been true specifically to certain garments or maybe garments from uh, specific regions, how they may have varied from one to the other. 
So she went to these museums and she looked at, I think it was 87 different night shirts or night sweaters that were in these museums. And then she, so she explains in here the history of these particular garments, how many hundreds of years that they were, they were worn and how they were worn because they were, like I said, they were worn during the day. You would have your um, like um, chemise or your shift that you would wear and then you'd, um, I don't know how many other layers they would put on, but then they would have this night sweater, which in the 19th century, in the 1800s was short, but in years before that was, was quite long, but they were short, like maybe 13 inches long from the shoulder down. And so they were easy to lift up if you were a woman who needed to breastfeed, for example. But they were short and then you'd have a vest over it and you'd have all these other clothes. So there wouldn't be very much of it actually showing. But she's got tons of photographs in this book, including paintings that were contemporary um, at that time of, of where you can see the person wearing their night sweater uh, th you can see it through the other different layers of clothing that they're wearing. So these items were um, knit. They used undyed wool to knit them and then they used these knit pearl texture patterns. And then they dyed the sweater after it was knit. So they didn't dye the yarn first, they dyed the sweater. And um, the colors were mostly like green or blue or black or red and apparently red was the color that was your best one like you would wear to church or something that was the color that you would wear uh, for those occasions but one of the things that's so interesting about this the subtitle of this book is 200 stars and other classic motifs from historic sweaters so this book contains the sort of the history of these night shirts lots of photographs of them then she talks about how people were knitting and she she was citing this, there was some person who was like a folk historian back in the 1800s who was in a, a parish rectory with some, several women who were knitting and observed that each of the women had a different style of knitting. One of them held the yarn in their left hand and the other two held the yarn in their right hand and the two that held it in the right hand di had different methods of doing it. And then at some point, I don't know if it was that same day or if it was over a period of time, they, they conduct an, an experiment to see which method was faster. And they noted that the method where the yarn was held over the left finger, um, the woman could knit 70 stitches per inch, but the girl who was like the milkmaid or what, whoever she was, who um, would insert the needle, let go of it, and, and then wrap the yarn around using her whole arm, she could only manage 30 stitches per inch. And then the other person who it looked like was using what they call the pencil method, where the needle kind of rests um, between the thumb and the forefinger and they were knitting this way. That one was somewhere in between. And they concluded from that that knitting with the yarn in the left hand was the fastest, most efficient method. But they also talked about, or either she does or they were talking about in this, in this book, that, um, that you get better tension if you were knitting with the yarn in your right hand, that, that you can get a tighter, more consistent tension if you're holding the yarn in your right hand and it tended to be looser, especially on the pearl rows if the yarn was in your left hand. And lots of people believe that that is true, that, left, that holding the yarn in your left hand is the most efficient. It can be, but there are other ways of holding the yarn in your right hand than the, than the two methods that were described in this book. And the sample size of three with one knitter who does each type doesn't really tell you anything. It tells you that the person who is holding the yarn in the left hand happened to be a very good knitter and very fast at that method. And that maybe the person who's holding it in the right hand maybe wasn't that great a knitter, but somebody could have been a lot faster. You know, the, the fastest knitters in the world that tends to alternate between someone who holds the yarn in their left hand and someone who holds it in the right hand. Anyway, I thought it was really interesting. And then she goes on to say that in 1889, there's a woman who wrote a book about like the work table, the woman's work table book or something. It's, it's like one of those uh, books that were published in the 19th century about all the different ways of, of um, constructing clothing and, and items that you need in your home. And it's, so it's, it's for that. But it, it became a textbook that the school children used. And the method that was described in that book was to hold the yarn in the left hand. And from then on, every child in Danish schools 
held the yarn in their left hand because that's how they were taught from that point forward. But clearly there were a variety of ways that people were knitting before that time period. Another thing that was interesting is she noted she had, had seen a copy of the earliest published book in Danish that described knitting. And it obviously wasn't going to be for people who were knitting for themselves at home. It was for a different sort of class of people. But it did give an indication of the different methods people used for casting on and that sort of thing. So that's really interesting as well. So all of that to me is just gold. I just love that. But then she goes on to she it's basically a stitch dictionary she divides up the different types of stitch patterns into type there's stars there's horizontal panels there's vertical panels and then there's these vertical twisting traveling stitch patterns that also include stars and then there's the the main patterns which are the patterns that would be used the all over pattern for the body of one of these sweaters and the const the construction method is really interesting it was that they were knit from the bottom up and they started with the sleeves. So they knit the sleeves first, cuff up, and then they, they knit the bodies bottom up. What's interesting is that the shoulder seams weren't at the top and they weren't at the back. The shoulders came up and over the top and then they were straight across right here. So there was a certain amount of depth right here. And it's not clear to me if that was unique to a particular region in Denmark or or what, but um, I haven't read as closely as I would like. So she has that stitch dictionary, and then she has actual garment patterns, and these are contemporary sweater patterns that use these traditional stitch patterns. But the subtitle of the book, this 200 stars, what she noted in the 87 um, sweat, night sweaters that she looked at was that something like 54 of them had Eight, these eight point stars on them that you see in traditional knitting throughout Northern Europe. It's it, and not even just in knitting, but it's this eight pointed star, which I'll, I'll put uh, up here on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. And so in these Danish sweaters, these were done using knits and pearls and twisted stitch patterns and these horizontal um, braids and just an amazing assortment of ways that they were used and they was all done in solid color because then the sweaters were just dyed a solid color afterwards. This wasn't stranded color work. So, so 50, 54 of these sweaters had stars in them and they were 34 unique star motifs amongst those. So there's a huge range of them. So in this book, she has, I think, 36 different stars that are eight pointed stars. And then she's got a handful of them that are like these 10 pointed stars. It's sort of like an eight pointed star that's been elongated and extra points were put in the middle of it. They're kind of, they're different looking. They're not, you, you know, you get so used to seeing that eight pointed star that a 10 pointed star looks a little strange. Um, so she has all of these different star patterns and then she's got the vertical, the horizontal, the all over patterns. And then she's got the, the garment patterns for uh, contemporary sweaters. So it's really, it's a beautiful book and like I said it it pushes all of my buttons and um, I can't I can't wait to look at it more thoroughly. There is one star pattern in here. What I love about this is that you do see the star patterns so often in stranded color work both in Fair Isle and Norwegian and in other places across North, northern Europe. But I had I had never seen it in texture and I tend to love texture knitting more I prefer that over color work and I got really ex and I really like traveling twisted stitch patterns and to see that combination um, of texture and using these very familiar symbols in ways that I had never seen them before was really interesting to me and got me really excited about it. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to Michigan to visit my mother, and as I always do when I go on a trip, when I'm at the gate or on the plane, I cast on for a sock. So um, I knit the first sock when I was there. I went to the local yarn shop and bought a contrast color for the heel because I had, once I saw how the color pattern was playing out, I decided I wanted a peasant heel and I wanted to do it in a contrast color. So I knit the first sock when I was there and I just finished um, the second sock the other day. So my mother, 
her birthday is in the middle of December. And so I like to send her a pair of socks or some other knitted item every year for her birthday. One of the sad things about visiting my mother is that she has dementia. She was a brilliant woman. She has a PhD in human genetics and then she went to medical school and was a family physician for years. So it's really hard to see her just not remember things. And, but one of the things that she does remember, every day she'd come out of her bedroom and she would have gotten dressed and she was wearing a pair of socks that I had knit for her and she knew that I had knit them for her. Um, she would repeat over and over again um, what I, the socks I was wearing. She would comment like three or four or five times during the day. Oh, those are really beautiful. Did you knit those? Yes, I did. Um, and every day a you know, different pair of socks and she would comment on them. So I know that she will know that I uh, knit these for her. So when I was a kid growing up, my mother was in graduate school. She was a single parent in graduate school. We didn't have much money. We got like one Christmas present, maybe two if it was clothes, <laughs> clothes and something else. We didn't have Christmas stockings. And I don't think it was because my mother was a poor graduate student. I think it's just because that wasn't part of her family culture growing up. And it wasn't part of my dad's either. We didn't have them when we would go visit him uh, at Christmas time either. But, and then I married a man whose family is Jewish, so uh, we don't celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah in our house. We celebrate uh, solstice. And um, my daughter's birthday is in late December. And so I, we really wanted to, to make the kids' birthdays the important things that we celebrated. And so we would celebrate Hanukkah with my husband's family or Christmas with my family if we were with them. Um, but we didn't do that in our house. But my brother married a woman whose family was super into Christmas and decorating and the Santa and all, all of that kind of stuff. And so when his, his son got married six years ago, uh, I asked him, would you guys like me to make you some Christmas stockings? Is that something you'd, you know, you'd want in your new home together at Christmas time is, is Christmas stockings? And as I always do when I make an offer that is my idea of something specific to knit for somebody, I'm always careful to say, if you do not want this, please let me know. I would prefer not to knit it for you if you don't want it. It's completely fine. My feelings aren't going to be hurt. Um, but please do not say yes out of politeness and then not actually use it or want it. You know, please, please let me know. So he said, no, no, we want it. And so then we had to figure out, well, what are those Christmas stockings going to be like? I happen to have a Christmas stocking pattern in my possession that I'd bought a number of years before for a friend who thought she might like to learn to knit and take over the responsibility of knitting Christmas stockings for new people in the family, whether it was a baby that was born or somebody married into the family. Um, her grandmother had done that and her grandmother had died. And so there was nobody to do that. And she thought, well, maybe I'll learn to knit. So I went and I bought, I bought it. She told me, explained what the, Chris, what the stocking looked like. So I bought something that was very similar to that. And I bought the yarn and I went to her house and we sat down and about 20 minutes into it, she's like, there's no way I am ever going to be a knitter. I, have, I do not like this. So I, she, I took the yarn and the pattern home and I had it. So I showed it to my nephew. I'm like, is this the kind of thing you wanted? It's one of those red and green white stockings with like the Santa head on it and with the, the little Angora puff ball. Um, and he's like, no, that's, that's not what we want. We don't want something like that with our names on it. And so I started looking around and I found some things that had stranded color work. And when you're talking to people who don't have any knitting knowledge, you have to kind of show them what you mean. So I was sending him pictures and I'm like, you want something like this or something like that? And so what it, what they wanted was stranded color work that had sort of motifs that were winter-like, um, but weren't specifically Christmassy necessarily and not in Christmas colors. They wanted unique colors for each stocking because they weren't going to have their names on it. Well, then the next challenge I had was 
I don't know how big a stocking is. So, you know, and did I want, I, I, this was going to be, had to be something that was going to be interesting to me to knit over and over again, perhaps once a year or every couple of years, I was going to have to be knitting these for a while. So I needed to be something that I knew would be interesting to me to knit. So I was looking at different, and I knew I wanted to use worsted weight yarn because I can get that in a million colors. And so I was looking at various stockings and I got ideas here and there from different places. And uh, one of the first things that I really liked was a stocking that had a Latvian braid around the top. And then there was a Norwegian star or one of those eight pointed stars that has become sort of um, known in Norway as a, the Norwegian star of the Selbu Rose. That eight point star that, that was in all the Danish knitting that I was talking about um, was known in Norway, but we, and we know that at a very specific time, 1847, a very specific young woman chose to use that eight point star in mittens, black and white mittens that she knit up and then wore to church. And they were very popular people, just loved them, and they became sort of associated with that town. It became a cottage industry to, ma to make these mittens. So it's known as the Selva Rose. And Norway even has that eight-pointed star on their flag. So it became part of the Norwegian sort of national identity to have this eight-pointed star. So when I look at it, I think Norwegian and Norwegian star, but now I know it's it was everywhere. It's just that Norway really held on to that Nor Norwegian star and they really use it in, in a lot of different things. So uh, so one of the stockings that used bulky weight had a Latvian braid and it had an eight pointed star on it and I liked that look but I didn't want to knit something in bulky weight but I liked the idea of that Latvian braid around the top. Then I found another stocking that um, it didn't have a Latvian braid it had like a, it was like hemmed at the top and it had some little stitch pattern at the top and then it had another version of the eight pointed star that was a little more elaborate and this one was in worsted weight uh, wool and it gave me a stitch count of 72 stitches that gave me an idea of how big around the stocking ought to be so then I just kept comparing other stockings to kind of figure out how long they should be um, but other but so I started with that Latvian braid and then that elaborate Norwegian uh, star the eight pointed star and from there I picked a variety of stitch patterns from a couple sources. Uh, I don't know exactly which ones, but um, which ones came from which place, but I probably, I'm pretty sure I used Alice Darmore's Charts for Color Knitting, which has just tons, and, and you can find things that are based on uh, how many stitches are in the repeat or how wide they are. You can find things that way. And then the traditional Fair Island Knitting by Sheila McGregor was another one that you can really look for. Like, well, I want something that is, you know, will fit in 72 stitches around, like it can do enough multiples of, to fit all the way around. Um, so I, I got uh, motifs from there. So the first two stockings were for my nephew and his wife. So his were in blues and hers were in greens. And so, so one of the design challenges that I had was how many colors do I use? Because we're not using Christmas colors. We're not using red, green, and white. So, and he wants blue and she wants green. So how am I going to do that? How many colors do I use? And then how do I determine when to use one as a background color versus foreground color? So one of the things I decided to do was to have three shades of colors, like a light color, a medium, and a dark. And what I would do is the light color would be just a natural kind of white color, but just natural color. And then the other two would be like a medium blue and a dark blue or a medium green and a dark green. And that was sort of how I decided um, to do that and then how I would lay out the pattern. So the darkest color would be the contrast heel and the toe, and then I would rotate uh, through the colors and all the different stitch patterns um, throughout the different sections. Because I was using this contrast uh, heel in the dark color, that meant that the section, the last section on the leg and the first section on the foot couldn't have a background of that darkest color, which meant that the foreground color for each of those sections was also the darkest color. So there are just things to think about in terms of making um, those colors work. Now, there's no reason why I had to uh, use 
that many colors. Oh, I could have just alter. I could have used two colors and alternated a white background with uh, the blue color for the design, and then had the blue bead background. You could do it in two colors. You could do it in eight colors if you wanted. But I just had to create some rules for myself to to get the design to work the way that I wanted it to work for me. Now, one of the things about color work knitting, stranded color work, or really knitting in the round in general, is that you're not really knitting in the round. You're knitting a spiral. So when you get to the end of the round, you are a row above the beginning of the round because the beginning, so the end of one round is right next to the beginning of the next round. So there's a, there can be a jog in the pattern. Uh, if you if the stitch pattern is something that's supposed to flow continuously and doesn't have any separation between the repeats, like a column of solid or something like that. So that can bug a lot of people. I haven't been concerned about it. I don't have too much of that. There's a couple places where that happens in this um, stocking, but I wasn't too concerned about it because at the beginning of the round right here is going to be the back, is going to be where I attach a loop to hang the stocking. So this is where the beginning of the round is and any jog that there is, it's just not going to be visible when the stocking is hanging. So I just don't worry about it. Um, but one of the things where that jog is really noticeable is with this Latvian braid around the top. And again, it hasn't bothered me too much because I also create an I-cord um, loop that I sew on right at that point and because it's, it's just not something anybody sees. But I have noticed it, and when I took the, a Latvian mitten class about a year and a half ago, obviously the Latvian braid is a, is a commonly used element in Latvian uh, mittens around the cuff. And I wondered how they handled the jog or if they handled the jog. And what was really interesting to find out, the teacher isn't really a knitting teacher. She's somebody, she's Latvian. She came from Latvia when she was a little girl and she knows how to knit and she knows how to knit Latvian mittens. So she was teaching us how to knit Latvian mittens, but she didn't know a lot about other knitting traditions or knitting styles. She just knows how she was taught to knit. And one of the things I remember her telling us when we were selecting our stitch patterns and then figuring out how many stitches around we needed for our mitten was that she really, didn't it didn't matter to her if she was able to complete full repeats all the way around the mitten if she had you know a, t a 10 stitch repeat but she had 55 stitches in her mitten she would just end the last repeat halfway through it and and she would just line everything up on the side there was an expectation that there would be a jog in the pattern there and it was just accepted like that's the way knitting works and that's how you do it so you put it in the place where it's the least obvious and you don't worry about it so it's just a really interesting um attitude and approach because contemporary knitters tend to be really upset if there's a jog in in the pattern and um and it's just interesting to see and read about how that is not necessarily of concern but having said that Contemporary knitters like to borrow techniques from one place and another and then create their own unique designs. And one of the things that they like to use is Latvian braids and they like to use them in the round and they get really upset when the jog um, occurs. So I knew that I was going to be knitting this stocking at some point this year because my nephew, my grand nephew was born in February and so this will be his first Christmas. And so I wanted to knit him a stocking at some point and I was having trouble finding the colors my niece actually wanted. I never did quite find what she wanted, but always in the back of my mind was, I was thinking, I wanna see if I can find a way to knit that Latvian braid without a jog. Like, and I tried a few things to see if I could do it while I was knitting and I couldn't. I was looking around at other people's videos and then I remember there's a Ravelry group called Knit Like a Latvian and they have a tremendous amount of resources uh, on there in their group. And one of the things they have is, you know, a bunch of like links to video tutorials and um, some of them are written tutorials. And one, so one of the things that they talk about is when you're knitting at a really fine gauge, like you would for these mittens, they really, really fine gauges, um, that jog isn't that noticeable, so they don't worry about it. 
and I had heard some people talking about using duplicate stitch to hide the jog and but nobody ever explained it or showed a picture so this uh, the other day I think it was yesterday morning I was sitting at my desk with my coffee and I knit a braid and then I tried a few different things like how would I do this if I was going to use duplicate stitch and because in my mind duplicate stitch is used in stockinette and this was obviously not stockinette stitch so I'm like well how would I do that and I came up with a way of doing it so in the next couple of weeks I'm going to be doing a technique to say video on the Latvian braid how to knit the Latvian braid isn't going to be really any different it's going to but what's I think will be interesting is how to finish that in a way to hide the jog um, so if that's something that you're interested in then that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks um, so it's a, it was a fun little challenge to, to think about. I actually emailed my friend Oli Petter, who's Swedish, and these braids are also used in um, Swedish knitting because it's a, a type of twined knitting, which is a traditional method of knitting in Sweden. And I thought, well, if anybody knows... <laughs> how to deal with that jog, Ole Petter would, because he learned to spin, he and his husband learned to spin in order to produce a specific type of yarn that is used in traditional Swedish twined knitting. And because the one company that produced that kind of yarn looked like it maybe it was going to go out of business. So that's why he learned to spin. So I thought he for sure would know. And his response to me was, ah, you know, <laughs> you know it is what it is and and he was saying that um they used to start the the beginning of the round at the at the palm and to hide it there so that you wouldn't see it here but that nowadays they they do it on the side um and i thought that was interesting because we I, I wonder if that was only entwined in the swedish traditional knitting because i don't know because the the pictures i've seen of latvian mittens from museums They'll show, they'll show the back of the mitten and then they show the thumb side and a lot of times you can't tell the difference because the thumb is in such perfect um, pattern continuity with the palm and you don't see any disruption here which makes me think that there, if there is any it's along the side. The other thing that's a little bit different it, with this particular stocking is that I'm using a different kind of needle. Um, these are those Addy Flexi Flips, I did a review on the original Flexi Flips a couple of years ago when they first came out. They're called Crazy Trios in Europe and in the US they're called Flexi Flips. Um, and somebody commented on that Flexi Flips review just a couple of weeks ago and asked me if I was going to review the Flexi Flips XL. Because one of, the, one of the issues that I had that's an issue that I have that it's not an issue like that I think applies necessarily to everybody in the world, but that my knitting style really requires a full five inch tip because of the way I, I hold the needles. And the original Flexi Flips, which are made for in sock needle sizes, had were standard eight inches in length and had like an inch in the middle of this um, it's like the kind of cable you have. Um, let me show you here. Here's one. So it's this, this they're like, uh, it's a double pointed needle that has a bit of cable in the center so that uh, the, the needle can, can flex like this. And it comes in a set of three. So essentially it's like knitting the two circulars method, only you, then you have a working needle. So you, you have fewer double points than you were if you were actually working with double points, but you have one needle more than you would have if you were working with the two circulars method. And then of course um, the cable is much shorter. Well, the original Flexi Flips were eight inches long, and so they had a one inch cable in the center, which meant that the tips were like three, three and a half inches long, something like that. And it's just too short for my hands. It hurt my hands. I couldn't hold the needles the correct way. It, it messed with my gauge. It slowed me down. So for me, they weren't useful, but I thought that they were a really interesting um, concept. And I thought, geez, if they came out with these where the tips were a full length, then maybe that would be something I'd want to use. So that's what the Flexi Flip XL is. It's a, it's a longer 
double pointed needle it has a little bit more cable in the center the tips are longer and the ones I have are bamboo and they have almost almost a five inch tip it's about four and three quarters inches it's just barely long enough for me to be completely comfortable holding them if they were a little bit shorter I probably wouldn't like them and in fact the metal ones are shorter so they have four types of flexi flips they've got the original metal ones which have the shortest tips and then they have a bamboo version which the tips are a little bit longer and then they have the xl versions so the metal xl versions have an even longer tip and then the bamboo ones have an even longer one but there's another difference between the original and the xl and that is in the tip diameters that are available so for the original flexi flips you can get sock needle sizes and but in the XLs, the smallest one you can get is a US six, which is a four millimeter needle. So I, I think what they're thinking is, oh, if you want a larger circumference, if you want to knit a larger circ circumference, then you can knit with the sock needles. Um, then you're going to want bigger needles or if you want bigger needles, they need to be longer or, or something like that. But that isn't necessarily true. Like for me, to knit socks, I wanted a longer tip, but I still wanted like a two millimeter um, diameter for my tip and you can't get those. And the metal ones are shorter anyway than these. And that's something I don't really understand either. And so these longer ones are not available in shorter tips um, or in smaller diameter tips and which I don't understand. So I've been trying these out in different ways. Uh, I've been using them for this stocking and, and I like it. That stocking is kind of an awkward circumference. It's about 14, 15 inches in circumference. So it's not quite big enough for a 16 inch circular. And I don't like 16 inch circulars anyway, because the tips are too short. So I typically knit the stockings using magic loop, but then at the midpoint of the round and the end of the round, you get this like corner you have to go around, which can cause some tension issues. So I've been um, seeing how the tension issues play out. And again, I don't do color work, stranded color work very often. So when I'm first starting out with a stranded color work project, I'm never happy with my tension. And also it hasn't been washed and blocked yet. Everything looks so much better after it's been washed and blocked. I'm not completely sure um, if it solves all my tension problems, but I do seem to like knitting the stocking better with these flexi flips. I've been using them to help me with my daughter's top down simultaneous set and sleeve sweater as well. Cause that's a, that's a project where you start at the sweater seams and you you're working across the front and then at the tops of the armholes or the sleeves and across the back. So you're, you're knitting this kind of a, almost an oblong shape that's very tight around these corners. And so I've been using these flexi flips, having, having one front on each one of these uh, and that, and then using the rest of the stitches are on a long circular and that's been helpful. So I've been using these, I've been finding some use for these and I've been really liking these. I just don't understand why they don't make them longer in the smaller diameter tips. One of the reasons that I would want a longer flexi flip with the smaller diameter tips is because when I knit socks, I often are, am knitting heel flaps and gussets. And when I'm at the beginning of a gusset, I'm going to have 50% more stitches than I would have for the sock leg. That's a lot of stitches and they have to be divided up on two eight inch double pointed needles. It's a lot of stitches on two needles. Like with regular double points, which might be eight inches, you would be dividing all of those stitches onto three needles or four needles. Um, but with the flexi flips, you don't. And they're fine if you're doing a short row heel or a peasant heel, that would work fine. But for the heel flap and gusset, if you're knitting an adult sock, they're just not long enough. So I would really want a longer flexi flip if I were going to use that. So we'll see if over the next few years, if they expand the flexi flip line even bigger, it'll be interesting to see. So this week's Technique Tuesday video was the alternating cast on, which some people call the Italian cast on. Uh, I didn't want to call it that for my video because there are at least two other cast on methods that also call themselves the Italian cast on. One of them is actually a tubular, 
cast on method. And the alternating cast on that I demonstrated looks very much like a tubular cast on, but it isn't. So I think there's a lot of confusion uh, around whatever an Italian cast on is. And, um, and an alternating cast on makes more sense to me um, because it's very similar in the motions uh, to the alternating long tail cast on. Both of those cast on methods alternate between uh, which, you, it's a two-stranded cast on and it alternates between which strand um, is used to produce the loops on the needle. And alternating cast on is what uh, June Hemmons Hyatt calls it in Principles of Knitting. So I've had a few questions about that cast on. One is, is there a Knit 2 Pearl 2 version? And there is. Uh, which uh, June Hemmons Hyatt actually created a, a method of doing it uh, for Knit 2 Pearl 2 and I'm going to uh, do a video on that in the next week or so. She did not, as far as I know, invent the alternating cast on. She just invented the Knit 2 Pearl 2 uh, version. So if you have this book, you can, you can see it's in there. So that's one question I've had. Uh, another one is what kinds of projects would you see this being used in? And another form of that question was, well, when would this be an appropriate cast on to use? Or when would it be a desirable choice or something like that? In most cases, a lot of cast ons that produce an edge are just your preference. If you like, if you enjoy the process of it, um, if you enjoy the sturdiness or the stretchiness of it, then that's the cast on that you should use or that you can use. Uh, there are some cast ons that have some very specific properties that uh, make them really well suited for some situations and not as well suited in others. Um, for example, knitting on is something that I would use if I needed a lot of stretch somewhere or just a couple of extra stitches at the end of a row or something like that. Uh, if I was going to be knitting something uh, and I needed to cast on a lot of stitches for for a lace item that was going to be aggressively blocked so that edge needed to be able to stretch as much as the lace, then I would use knitting on because that's going to, to, to do that um, best. If I needed something that was sturdier and had some stretch but but maybe not a lot of stretch, uh, I would use a cable cast on. Now a lot of people think or it's claimed that the cable cast on is very stretchy. It can certainly have some stretch but it is less stretchy than other cast on methods. Some people find the long tail cast on to be not stretchy and very rigid and that has to do with how you control um, the yarn that creates the, the bottom edge. If you're tightening your stitches too much then that's because that's why your cast on edge is rigid. It's not because there's anything inherently bad about the long tail cast on. So the alternating cast on creates a knit one pearl one edge. So if you are working in knit one pearl one ribbing, that would be a great choice. If you're going to be knitting in seed stitch, that would be another option where you cast on in the knit one pearl one uh, pattern and then when you start working, you work stitches the opposite of how they present in order to work them in seed stitch. So you could use it for that as well. Uh, you, you wouldn't probably want to use it for a knit two pearl two uh, ribbing because it wouldn't look attractive. Um, but the version that is for knit two pearl two could be a really good choice. But there isn't any specific project. It would be like whatever project it is that's calling for knit one pearl one ribbing, it would be appropriate. When you are getting ready to start a project and if you're thinking you might want to try something new when it comes to a cast on method, as part of your swatching process, try that cast on and see how you like it. Um, and then you'll know whether you like the process of creating that cast on, if you like the look of it, and if it's going to be compatible with the stitch pattern that you are using in your project. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.